A few months ago, I published a book with the same title as this talk, and my co-author was a German AI entrepreneur, uh, engineer. Uh, he's also a physician, a mathematician. He has multiple talents. He's currently working on quantum physics. We're trying to build a quantum physics ontology. Uh, he is a very clever man, and he knows what you can do with AI because he's been trying to do interesting things with AI for 15 years or longer. And you can do some very interesting things. So we are both very much advocates of AI, but we're skeptical about whether it can be as intelligent as human beings. And that's what the book is about. In order for AI machines to take over the world, they would have to be more intelligent than we are. And they will never be even equally intelligent than we are. In fact, we don't think that they will ever be as intelligent as a rabbit. The problem in all of these cases is that we have general intelligence, and AI is successful only along very narrow chains, like playing Go or deciphering protein folding. In other words, you can build an AI that can do wonderful things along a certain narrow track, but humans have general AI. All right, this is the book. There is a lot of hype about AI and about the possibility of the singularity. The singularity is supposed to occur when AI systems are built which are equally or more intelligent than humans, and then those AI systems will build new AI systems which are more intelligent still, and then we will have an explosion of ever more intelligent AIs, and Elon thinks that they will overtake the world in two years' time. Uh, we will come back to address this prediction uh, in, in two years. Now, what would it take to overcome human beings? Well, two factors. One is the machines would have to want to overtake human beings. And the kind of want, the kind of desire or intention that, that machines can have is very limited. I'll come back to that at the very end. For the, first of all, I want to talk about superintelligence. And there's a, a, a really nice book uh, by a, a, a philosopher called Nick Bostrom called Superintelligence. And the funniest chapter in the book, chapter 10, is all about Nick Bostrom's uh, a strange claims. So according to Nick, there are three ways to build a superintelligence. One is by emulating human brains. One is by enhancing human brains. And then the main one, the one which we're worried about, which would lead to the singularity, is by means of AI. And that means today using statistics, using statistical learning techniques to give the machine the power to make predictions, which are sometimes very surprising and very impressive. And responding to a question in a conversation is called a prediction. This is just the way the word is used. So a prediction is extended to include not just predicting events in the future, but producing behavior in response to what are called prompts. And we'll see more of this as we go down. Our brain emulation won't work. People have all kinds of dreams of building cyborg, entities which would have brains which are exact copies of human brains. The brain is just too complicated. There aren't enough molecules in the world to emulate the even one single human brain atom by atom, because there are just too many atoms in the human brain. Moreover, in order to build an emulation in a machine, we need to know how the human brain works in mathematical terms. And if you look at textbooks of neurology, you see almost no mathematical equations. So we know almost nothing mathematically about how the brain works. Very hard to get data about how the brain works because to get that data, you would have to kill the patient. And then every human brain is different. So you, you would have to do it many, many times, e even in order to get some kind of sample set. And you can't even do it once. And then finally, and this is very important, people talk about neural nets. And they use the word neural, but this is just a trick. It's a happy talk. There is no connection between neural networks in a machine and the neurology of, of a brain. Now, the second route is by breeding superintelligent beings. And, and Nick has some really interesting ideas here. If, if we select embryos and, and remove 999 out of every thousand embryos, 
uh, resulting from people breeding, then we would be able to raise the IQ level by 20, he says this, 24.3 IQ points. This is absolute nonsense. There is absolutely no way, A, that you can get a thousand pairs to agree to this experimental breeding effort, and B, predict in advance that you would raise the IQ by 24.3 points. It's nonsense. And this is why chapter 10 is the funniest chapter, because Nick's book is full of nonsense like this. He thinks we can raise it by 300 points. Anyway, I won't go any further. This is just not. So the main problem here is stochastic AI. Can, that's the mainstream AI today. Can we use stochastic AI to build a machine which is more intelligent than a human being? Now, stochastic AI is successful all over the place. So it's stochastic AI that runs the spam filter that means that you avoid being overwhelmed with spam every single day of your life. It gets rid of most of it. How does it do that? Well, it borrows your work. Every time you receive a spam email, you press the spam button, and that sends a datum to the Gmail or some other uh, headquarters, and that detail is used to build a spam filter. I'll explain how it works in a minute. This is an example of narrow AI. And as I said before, the worry about the singularity is, is based on the idea that we can get narrow AI, which is so good that it becomes general AI. We have a thinking machine. And the whole book is, is designed to prove mathematically, as well as by means of citing uh, Bostrom and doing other things, that we will never have such a general AI. Everything in, in computer land is binary vectors, zeros and ones, long strings of zeros and ones. We turn the email into a binary vector, and then we have either zero or one, according to whether the email it has been classified by the user as spam or not spam. And so as more and more users press the spam button, we get a gigantic database. And then we use this database to do what is called training the neural net. And what this means is that we turn the data, the tuples of emails and zeros and ones, we turn that into a gigantic polynomial function, which can then be applied to a new binary vector, in other words, to a new email, and either push the email to one side so that you never see it, or let it through the filter. This is a, a polynomial function with thousands or millions of terms connected together. And it's a sim mathematically simple, it has to be, because computers can only execute simple functions. But because it's so huge, it can do impressive things like identify spam. This works well. So spam filters really work. But then the evil people who create spam invent new kinds of spam. And then the spam filter doesn't work anymore because it's narrow AI. And that means it's based upon a certain closed set of training data. So you need to retrain it. The better you were, the, the, if you have a really good spam filter, that will just energize the evil people who also spam to, to make new spam more quickly. So there's a kind of arms race here. You need to collect new training data, and you're going to need to do this regularly, perhaps continuously, in order to keep pace with what the evil people are doing. You have to keep relaunching the spam filter. That's the, uh, the issue here. Now, AI works really well for spam filters. It doesn't work for predicting the stock market, for instance. Again, it might work, might work for a few milliseconds, but then the other participants in the market are going to realize that there's something going on down there, and they're immediately going to change their behavior, and you'll never be able to keep up in this particular arms race. So what quant people do in the financial world is not the kind of thing which predicts stock prices. It's the kind of thing which finds arbitrage possibilities in microseconds and then addresses those arbitrage possibilities. And you make money that way. If somebody did create, and I'll give you an example of somebody who thinks they've created a way of predicting stock prices in a minute. If you, if you thought you'd done that, then you would very quickly be disabused of your belief.
All right, so where does it work? What's the difference between spam filters and stock prices? The answer has to do with the, the statistical concept of a distribution. So this is the bell curve, a very, very simple distribution. There are more complicated distributions. But for AI to work, you have to have a distribution. And the stock market or the oil price or the earthquakes incidents and so on, they do not have a distribution. That's why we can't predict any of those. So what you need is two things. You need to have a distribution, and then you need to collect training data, which it has the same variance as that distribution, it has the same variance, not just now, but also in the future. And as we saw, even when it works, it then doesn't work. But it, if it works for a sufficient length of time, as in the case of spam filter, it's still useful. Sometimes it works always. In the case of the stock market, it works hardly ever. So we need two things. We need the same variance in the machine as we have in the domain that we're trying to predict the behavior of. And we need to collect training data huge samples of training data, billions of data. For the brain, we can't collect any data or very little data. We could make holes in people's brains, but we don't have uh, imaging devices that can see molecule for molecule what's going on in the brain. So we can't collect the training data, but the brain in any case doesn't have a distribution, or at least it, it probably doesn't have a distribution that we could do anything with. We, don't, we know some things about how brains and how whole organisms work. So I know, I can predict now with 100% accuracy, that you will fall asleep within the next 36 hours. Just as I can predict with, I don't know, some accuracy that it will rain within the next four days. If I check weather forecasts, I can get a, a prediction. But these kinds of predictions don't tell us how rain is created, specifically where and when. It tells us that on the basis of patterns of statistical regularities over the past, we can predict with a, a certain error margin that the, the rain will come uh, in two days. And what we can predict with regard to the behavior of an organism is, is similar to that. It's not prediction in the sense that I, I can predict that you will start thinking about the weather in three minutes or something like that. It's not something that is very useful. If you want to build a machine that will simulate the behavior of a human being, it's not good enough to make the machine fall asleep every 24 hours. That wouldn't get you a thinking machine. It would get you a, a machine which is emulating certain behaviors. But those behaviors are relatively few. They're not mathematically precise enough, even with regard to sleep. We, we know that you will sleep, but we don't know exactly when, nor how well you will sleep and so on, because all kinds of things happen between you and sleeping, which disturb your sleep or which make you have a nice, happy sleep. We need to have the ability to make mathematical predictions in order to, to have in the machine an emulation of what we have in the outside world. Freezing a complex system to make a simple system model can be very useful. We can use it to predict protein foldings, for instance. And we can use it for Google Translate. So let's work our way through Google Translate, first of all. What we need to do is to take many human natural languages, each of which is a gigantically complex system, which is changing sometimes on a daily basis, freezing it to make for each one of those languages a si simple model. But by simple, we mean a gigantic polynomial equation with billions of parameters. So a really long polynomial equation. So it's not simple in any normal sense. It's still very complex, but it's not a complex system. It's a simple system, which means we can use it to make predictions. So we have here our emulation, our simple model, which is a really complex algorithm. We input a German text corpus and an English text corpus so that the two can be mapped one from the other. And then we, the user of, the, of Google Translate brings a sentence in German. It's translated into binary vectors. It goes into our model and it's associated then with word embeddings in e English and thereby translated into an English sentence. And there is no semantics here. Google Translate doesn't understand the meanings of anything. It just churns its way through long binary vectors. And 
using in in the case uh, this is two years old so it's probably bigger now but then it was 213 million parameters a really long equation and you can create edge cases so I dropped my cell phone in puddle. That's, that's the sentence that I heard on my last trip to England. A very poor gentleman who just dropped his cell phone into a puddle in Northern English. And if you put that into Google Translate, you get uh, this sentence. And if you translate that into English again, you get the exact opposite of what the poor gentleman dropped into a puddle. Now, you can make such edge cases all over the place, which means that Google Translate works really well where it has lots of data, but then where it has only bits of data, which is true for people speaking Lancashire, then it will fail. And now OpenAI is the latest really impressive uh, artifact of this method, namely, now we're taking the whole of the internet, practically speaking, or the whole of the useful linguistic content of the internet, including all of Wikipedia and many, many other sources of data, and we're going to freeze it in a very, very sophisticated way, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then we're going to use that frozen internet world or that frozen language world, which is includes languages other than English, of course, and we're going to turn it into an engine for responding to English sentences or English text created by human beings. And there are other examples of these large language models. I'm just going to talk about ChatGPT. Meta Galactica, which was the attempt to create a, a useful large language model, it, it crashed within the first 24 hours because it started talking about Adolf Hitler too much. And the Google Bard, it, 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 I'm not really sure about um, its current state, but when it was first released, it made a small mistake uh, when it was describing the, the, um, the James Webb Space Telescope. And as a result of that small mistake, $100 million were lost by Google on the stock market within seconds. So Google Bard still needs work. OpenAI have created a, a solution to the Adolf Hitler problem which I'll talk about in a minute. ChatGPT is fantastic. So I spend far too much time playing with ChatGPT. And it's really good at producing good, which means grammatically good English. It's a little bit boring. So it, 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 it's bland and it makes mistakes all the time. And when you point this out, then it, it apologizes immediately and then makes the same mistakes again, typically. But it's interesting to, to see its limits. And I'm going to show you mainly limits. I invite you to, to play with it here, and then you'll see some of its, uh, its, its real achievements. So ChatGPT, I can well understand, is likely to make you think that, hum that computers can already think. And they can think in English very convincingly. They make mistakes all the time, but they produce English sentences, entire paragraphs, entire essays, but it treats this smaller number of sentences very impressively until it doesn't. None of these machines think because machines can't think. They can process binary vectors to output new binary vectors. So I started kicking the tires yesterday. I want this to be of interest to people in the School of Management. So I picked, I picked a problem case at random. Dominic's problem is the umlaut in his name, I think, because ChatGPT really makes a mess of Dominic. So he didn't write any of these papers. Um, so although they are listed as the five most important papers, one of them is called Snort. And I'm absolutely sure that he never wrote a paper about Snort. So I tried again. So th this list doesn't give the co-authors. And so I asked it to give the five most important papers published by Dominic Rusch, including the names of the co-authors. And this is really impressive because Le Kun is one of the really important AI experts. And so you should all be proud that you have a colleague who is co-authoring papers with Le Kun, according to ChatGPT. But now there's obviously something wrong here because he's not only interested in AI. So I tried adding that he's in the School of Management. 
And this is the response I got. So you see that you, you should never use ChatGPT to write papers unless you are very careful to check that you're citing papers or even journals which actually exist. ChatGPT, in my own case, makes up journals. All right, now, how are we to conceive of ChatGPT? Well, th this is a story about early versions of the Xerox photocopying machine, which used digital representations of images in order to save computing space, and then uncompress the digital image files. And in order to use less computer space, uh, it would cheat. So if it had several numbers, it would just choose the first number and make all the other numbers equal to a, re a really silly idea. And it was abandoned after uh, people noticed it. it was abandoned very quickly. Jack GPT is like that. It cheats. And um, so it, it can be described as a lossy paraphrase generator for text. It's not just lossy, it's also uh, hallucinating. That is to say, it's creating new bits and pieces. But basically, it's a lossy paraphrase. And it's lossy because it has to freeze all this complex systems into a simple system. And you do that by, by cheating, by identifying one thing with another. It's good for creating summaries, but the output is bland, as I said. And it's also a little bit nauseatingly friendly. So it will say more than you want because it can. And then it makes mistakes, which are called hallucinations. Now, again, it doesn't know anything. It doesn't think. It doesn't have any meanings. It just knows about the language distribution of the English and of some other languages. So it can produce syntactically really good output but it doesn't understand anything. All right, now how does it work? It works by having a string of input syllables, and then it has a gigantic lossy image of the entire language of the internet, roughly, and it knows what the next most likely syllable will be. And so it gives you that. This is massive cheating, but it works. It's fantastic. It gives you sentences because it can always predict the next most likely syllable. So here, the best thing about AI is its ability to, and the next most likely syllable is learn. So it says learn because it knows that lots of people in the internet say learn after a string like that. It doesn't actually always give you the next most likely because if it does, it very rapidly degenerates into repetition. So it adds a, a little bit of randomness so that it won't repeat itself over and over again. How did it come up with this as a likely word following the name Rush? And the answer is him. So there is a man called Martin Rush who writes about snort all the time. I have no idea what snort is, but I think it's some kind of uh, logic system. And now it sees, the, the, so ChatGPT sees rush, and it sees that snort is a high likelihood following syllable, and so it creates papers with the word snort in the titles. It knows to put the word snort in the titles. It doesn't put snort as the name of an author. That's already impressive, sort of. Now let's try something which uh, appeared on the web from a company which is famous for having made huge amounts of money by buying Google when it was only four cents a share. And so they're still giving out stock buying advice and they give advice on the basis of different methodologies. And now they're starting to use ChatGPT to give stock market advice. Now you have to remember that ChatGPT froze the internet in the year 2021 and still eons ago in stock market price prediction terms, but still it thinks it can use ChatGPT to predict stock market prices. Now, these are examples of stocks whose value was rising impressively before 2021. And so there are lots of phrases like Amazon just rose 17% overnight because, which create a statistical pile connecting stock market rising with Amazon or Tesla. And so you see this on the internet. I asked ChatGPT to recommend me that this person doesn't know English. 
recommend to me the top five biggest growth stocks to buy. And that's what it gives. Now, this is just a misunderstanding of how ChatGPT works. It works on the basis of old language closeness. And that doesn't predict anything about the future in an area of a system like the stock market. And it does it with crypto too, exactly the same method, which is absolute nonsense. If you really want to predict what will be good cryptos to buy, you shouldn't look back to what were language statistics facts in 2021 or indeed yesterday. So ChatGPT is a piece of applied mathematics that uses statistical methods to find patterns in language. Let's see how it works. And th this is material which was worked out by, uh, by Jobst, my co-author. So we start with a foundation model, which is GPT 3.5. And the foundation model is built by taking all, all of language, I'm simplifying now, and making the statistical regularities as between one word and the next word or one syllable and the next syllable as transparent and accessible as possible. So it, re it basically removes confusing irregularities. This is what is needed in order to get good syntax. This is what is needed in order to create Google Translate. So Google Translate isolates all those statistical regularities, which will help you to go from a German sentence to an English sentence or from an English sentence to a German sentence, modulo using the frozen languages. All right, and that's how it looks. I'm not going to say anything about it. Then there are three further steps, which are, and then comes the Adolf Hitler step, the final step. So the first step, you have a database of typical tasks that people ask questions about. How can I teach a six-year-old how the moon landing uh, works? So you have this, this database of prompts, they're called, or tasks. And then you have hundreds and thousands of people in India who give you a huge sample of responses to those prompts. And you pay them. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, Google can pay for this. And then you use that data to fine tune what you got from the transformer model in the step zero. Then in step two, you create a database of sample outputs. So again, you get people in India to give outputs to this prompt and you get lots of such outputs. And then you pay humans to rank those outputs. And Thereby, you build a reward model. Now, this is really important. The way, the way that the AlphaGo works is that you can assign computationally a reward to every step. You can't do that with conversations between humans, but you can do it with rule-governed games like Go. And what that means is that you can get the computer to play millions of games of Go with itself and use that data to perfect a Go playing machine, which can win even against a, a world master of Go. This is called a reward model. This is the, the crucial step in ChatGPT. It made the reinforcement learning, which explains how AlphaGo could beat human players at Go. It applies that to conversation. This is amazing. It's a, a really important step, except when it isn't. <laughs> because it makes things up. All right, then the final step uh, before the Adolf Hitler step is to use this data that you've collected about how rewards were assigned over millions and millions of conversations. You use this data to adjust the policies which the machine uses to create outputs. So it produces syntactically good outputs, but which will get a high reward when measured using the reward system as an answer to the question or the prompt which it's responding to. It's amazing, it's, it, and it costs billions of dollars uh, because you had to have so many runs through really, really complicated uh, algorithms. Now, the reward system is the nearest we get to having a machine with a will. AlphaGo did not want, didn't will winning at Go. It didn't want to win. 
It wanted to maximize reward. Where we can have a computer assigned reward, we can get a really good analog of will. We can't, we can't have a really good analog of the kind of will which is exemplified in human face-to-face -face conversation or in conversations between Putin and, uh, and uh, Biden or in any other important conversation because there's no reward system. You can have a reward system only if you have relatively simple bits and pieces which you're putting together. This is the, the uh, keeping Adolf Hitler out of the output part. This is purely deterministic. It's not stochastic. It, it, it basically it identifies hate speech. It identifies sexual violence and so on and, and just blocks it or tries to block it. All right. As I say, this is very complicated, very expensive. Um, it's also not explainable. There's no way in which you can explain how, a, how an algorithm with billions of parameters works. It, that means it's not fixable easily. How, how, do you, how do you fix these making up new journals or new, uh, new uh, papers problem? That you can't do that because you have no point where you can plug that, um, plug that in. All right, so I'm coming to an end now, and I'm going to give you something which may or may not be relevant to the School of Management. So we're all interested in what AI, this new AI, the chat GPT, large language model-based uh, AI, can bring for companies who might want to use it or invest in it. And McKinsey created this chart, and Jobst, who knows very well because he's, he's implementing AI systems himself, he knows what, what particular kinds of AI can really achieve. And so he, he created his own scoring system. So the orange are of some benefit, but it's very limited. So writing, marketing, or sales copy uh, brings some benefit. You, 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 you're paying people to do that now. Very soon, it will probably be possible to pay a computer programmer, we, who are also people. Um, but then the, once you program the computer, you can produce perhaps lots and lots of copy, but probably you'll need to pay people to produce the really imaginative and new kinds of copy and so forth. So it's a limited benefit. And then uh, the three at the bottom, Jobs describes as, as hot air. So the, the bottom one, create business uh, presentation that could convince somebody to take your gadget and pay for it. Uh, that, that is hot air. You won't be able to get chat GPT to do that kind of thing. It's not exciting. It's, it produces bland output. And if you ask it to produce exciting output, it will say, I am just an AI based language model. I cannot do this or that. And, and, and then it will try and do it and fail miserably. This is a second list. So Jobs thinks that the, the bottom two deserve uh, a green uh, reward. Enable search and question answering is something which is quite hard to do. His, com his company has been doing that for some time for insurance companies and medical and pharmaceutical organizations. Uh, it's hard to do, and chat GPT will certainly make it easier to do. So this is somewhere where we can have real value. And then automated accounting. Uh, so ChatGPT can also do some tricks in the world of computer program authoring, and it will be able to do the same tricks in the world of accounting. So this is an area where there is a possible benefit of a serious sort. I'll just go back to the previous slide for a minute. So um, McKinsey thinks that it can create business presentations. McKinsey thinks that it can summarize and highlight changes in large bodies of regulatory documents. That's hot air. There's no way that ChatGPT can think itself, as it can't think, into the frame of mind that can understand why specific changes in regulatory documents have been made. That requires a human. I can give you a nice highlighted presentation of where the changes are made, but it can't summarize those changes in an, a new document. Now, finally, quite. So what is Milton Friedman's favorite cocktail? It's a really good question to ask about anybody. So chat GPT will give you a different answer to the very same question every time you ask it. So I asked it this three times. First time it gave this, which I'll explain in a minute. 
Second time, it, it gave an account of how Milton Friedman used cocktail mixing language as a model of how an economy works, which I just threw away. And the third time was it said, there is no data about whether Milton Friedman had a favorite cocktail. I apologize. It said. Now, so what did it say here? Well, um, according to a 2006 article in the Wall Street Journal, Friedman was known to enjoy whiskey sours. Now, I tried everything I could in the web to find any evidence for this. There is no evidence. I'm not going to go through the whole of the Wall Street Journal for 2006, but I bet your life that there is no such article. But I know that this book, I have a copy of this book, Milton Friedman on Freedom, doesn't mention very dry gin martinis or any kind of martinis or any kind of cocktail. It's a collection of his papers. And uh, so ChatGPT makes things up. It likes making things up, does it all the time. All right, that's the end.